You give Teller from Jerusalem 20 minutes, and he'll give you the education of a lifetime. King of the storytellers and the Shakespeare of the Torah world, here is Rabbi Hanok Teller. OMG, that is so over the top. After this introduction, I even want to hear what I have to say. Welcome everyone to Teller from Jerusalem, and our initial episode is the first installment of the early struggle to build the State of Israel. Israel is a story of a homeless people that kept the dream alive for millennia, of a people's redemption from the edge of the abyss, of a nation forging a future when none seemed possible. The Jews had dreamed for 2,000 years of returning to their ancestral homeland. Their daily liturgy is replete with references to Jerusalem, and that God should answer, answer our requests to go back to Zion and the land of Israel. Wherever a Jew may be, wherever they are in the world, their prayer is always focused and pointed towards Jerusalem. If you're in the West in America, then you're in Canada, you're facing towards the land of Israel, it means you're pointing east. If you're in Russia or in Poland, you'll be facing south. If you're in the, in the Orient, you're in China, you'll be facing west. In South Africa, you'll be facing north. And since the destruction of the temple by the Romans in the year 70 CE, Jews were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, and they fervently prayed to return to the land of Israel and to Jerusalem. The conclusion of the Passover Seder every year is the prayer next year in Jerusalem. Likewise, at the end of the Yom Kippur service, at the very climax, it concludes by saying, next year in Jerusalem. That is the fervent prayer. As Sir Martin Gilbert writes, for two millennia, the dream of a returning to a homeland seemed a fantasy. And to me, this is reminiscent of the fable of the boy who was in the park with flying his kite on a very foggy day. And he's running with the string and an old man sees him and he says, little boy, what are you doing? Why am I flying a kite? Little boy, there's nothing there. But I'm telling you, I feel that tug and I feel that hug. There's nothing there. So that's just an analogy, is that people say, you can't see God, but I feel in my heart, I feel that tug and I feel that hug. That's why the people of Israel felt towards the land of Israel. That tug was always there, and who but A.B. Rottenberg could put this to music. Well, someone passed by, looked at me strange. He asked, what you doing on this day so fair? How could that be? Can't you see, little boy? There's nothing up there. Though I can't see you, I do understand. You're tugging and pulling, a string in my hand. You're tugging and pulling, the string in my hand. You're tugging and pulling, the string. So, bereft of a land of their own, the Jews learned to adapt to their exile addresses. And when they were expelled, which happened often, they learned to adapt to their new addresses. The hope to return to Israel, or Zion, seemed at first to be an unrealistic hope. By the way, the name Palestine is a name that dates back to the Romans in their attempt to eradicate any remembrance of the stiff rebellion that the Jews launched against their rule. They sobered the temple with salt, and they renamed Judea after the Jewish enemy, Philistinia, hence the name Palestine. So how could Jews ever fulfill their wish to return to the land of Israel, which had been under Muslim rule since the 7th century, and under the rule of the Ottomans since the 16th century? For the diehards that were prepared to make that long, grueling trek to the land of Israel, it meant going on a very perilous journey, of which about one-third died en route. And then when they arrived, they still had to face the hardships of an unfriendly region, a difficult climate, and a government that was extremely indisposed against them. Before 1880, there were about 25,000 Jews living in the land of Israel, almost half of them in Jerusalem. After 1890, over 50% of them will be in the city of Jerusalem. These were very devout Jews who were supported by their communities, communities which they had come from in Europe, through the system of chalukah, which means a dispersion or a distribution of funds. The idea of chalukah, of giving out distributing funds, 
is perhaps by way of analogy best to be expressed like missionary support. There are some church denominations that fully fund missionaries to go out and spread the gospel, the largest being the Southern Baptist Convention. The majority of missionaries rely upon the generous donations of the church or other denominational boards to make up their budget. Often it's up to the missionaries themselves to raise their money and they're often forward and they'll approach benevolent, magnanimous individuals and ask them to partner with them regarding prayer and finances. And it's not uncommon for these forward missionaries to be so forward to say, let's split. You give me $50 a month or $100 a month or even more, and then I'll pray on your behalf. Or if you come from England, on your behalf. Now, when it comes to being forward, the non-Jews have nothing on the Jews when it comes to being forward. Jews are very good at soliciting funds. There's a genre of humor just about petitioning money with the UJA, the United Jewish Appeal, being the butt of all the jokes because they really know how to squeeze someone for all the money they have on behalf of important Jewish causes. And now before I tell a joke about the expense of the UJA and how they're able to solicit so well, I just want to explain the rabbinic teaching based in the Medrash that a baby is born with a clenched fist. When a person dies, the hand is open. And all of life and growth is learning to bridge that rubric between a clenched fist and an open hand. And indeed, if a person dies, the hand is not open, the burial society will open the hand to learn to bridge that gap from a closed fist to an open hand. That's what life and growth and maturation is all about. So there's a story that there was a circus act, and the circus came to town, then came the act of the strong man. So this big, gruff, buff guy comes out, and for his first act, he lifts this weight over his head. And for the second act, he takes his fist and puts it right through a solid iron wall. And for the third act, he takes out a lemon. And he takes this lemon, and he gives a kvetch, and all of a sudden, there is a torrent of juice. And then the torrent, it turns into a dribble, and then not just even one drop is left. The circus manager comes out and he says, ladies and gentlemen, and he holds up two crisp $100 bills. Whoever can squeeze one more drop out of this lemon, I will award $200. So two guys, very muscle-bound, they can't even pick their noses, they're so muscle-bound, walk up to the stage, they take the lemons, and not a single drop. Anybody else, says the circus manager. And this old man, bent over, balding pate, large square glasses, slight frame, steps up, and everyone in the circus is snickering. He goes up, he takes the lemon, he gives it a squeeze, and all of a sudden, there's a torrent of juice coming out of the lemon. And he said, who are you and what's your name? He said, my name is Seymour Goldstein, and I'm a fund solicitor for the UJA. Now, this analogy only works conceptually. There is no missionary overseeing board for Jews who travel to Israel and basically travel to Israel to, there, to be there for the end of their lives, so much so that the Arabs referred to them as the children of death. They would write home to their home communities requesting money and begging for help. Sometimes they send back an emissary to raise funds. By and large, they were people without any political ambition, and they were these pious individuals who, as we said, came to Israel in order to die. They lived through Chalukah, through a distribution of funds. In Yiddish, the term for a son-in-law is Edim. Edim means son-in-law. I call my sons-in-law my Gan Edims. They're my gardens of Eden. Uh, and Edim in Kest means a son-in-law that you support. So it's the same idea. So just like there's a yeshiva, which if they support students, they give them a stipend, which is called Chalukah, which means the distribution. Likewise, if people support their son-in-law, it's called an Edom and Kest, and they support their son-in-law. And there's a story that Friday night after prayers, a man went to the synagogue to see if there were any guests who needed a place to eat. He saw some people milling about, and he said, tell me, does anybody here need a meal? And one person raised his hand. He said, oh, come to me. You'll be my guest. The person was very happy. And then all of a sudden, the guest turned to another gentleman. And he said, psst, 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 come. And so the host looked at it a little funny, but anyways. So they're walking home, and the entire way, ay yeah, 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 yeah. this guest turns to his other guest, the other guy following him, and he says, psst, 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 psst. And the host is totally confounded and confused. What is he doing? But no, no. 
and they're walking, getting closer and closer and closer. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And as they approach the home, the guest turns to this other man and says, psst, psst, psst. They're just near the house. The host once again looks at the guest, and the guest says, psst, psst, psst. And he says, what are you doing? Who is this guy? Why? That's my Adam and Kest. I support him. It was about at this time, 1882, there's an upswing of violent attacks against the Jews, and there's a threat of pogroms, particularly in Russia, and it's a matter of life and death to get out. The United States was the preferred destination for those that were fleeing from the old country, particularly from Russia, to get away from the pogroms and all the torture, degradation, persecution, prosecution. Uh, but about 1% did come to the land of Israel. Now, 1% is not all that much, but we're talking about large waves. By the year 1900, about 700,000 people every decade are emigrating out of Russia, going to America. 1% is a significant number. Uh, it jacks up the numbers. And those Jews that are coming to Israel from Russia are now about 25,000 Jews between 1892 and 1903. About 90% of them will leave after coming to Israel. Uh, but this is going to be called the first Aliyah, the first ascension to Israel, and that will feature better in coming episodes. It's at about this time, ay, 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 ay. three settlements are established in Israel. Two of them will become later major metropolitan areas in the land of Israel. Uh, the first is Zichron Yaakov, that was financed by Baron Edmund de Rothschild, known as the unknown or the well-known benefactor. Zichron Yaakov means remembrance of Jacob. It was named after his father, safe to assume his father's name was Jacob and not remembrance. Then there is Petach Tikva, which means the opening of hope. These names of these cities all have a biblical origin. And Petach Tikva nearly collapsed because of malaria and Arab attacks. Us urbanites do not appreciate how unbelievably dangerous malaria is, or the mosquito. The mosquito is the most dangerous animal on this planet. Every year, mosquito kills, on a good year, one million people. That means every 30 seconds, pardon me, every 30 minutes, one baby, one child will die to malaria. It's an extremely deadly thing. And uh, nothing sexist here, but it's the female mosquito, which is so dangerous. Next city was Rishon Lezion, the first of Zion. And here, too, the funds ran short. Uh, they have a shallow well, which is much too shallow. So an emissary travels to Paris to appeal to Baron Edmund de Rothschild to give sufficient funds to dig, to dig a deep well. They turned him for financial assistance because he's a, a kind, a gener gener generous, benevolent, magnanimous individual. Now, he could have easily distributed the funds and be done with it. But obviously, the Baron understood Maimonides' concept of, Maimonides writes about the eight levels of charity, or as Julie Solomon, the author, writes, the Rambam's ladder. Ladder because that gives a visual metaphor. And the highest rung of the ladder is when you put someone on their own feet. In other words, like the famous analogy, a person turned to a fisherman for something to eat. He said, if I give you a fish, you have a meal. If I teach you how to fish, I've given you a livelihood. So the Baron wanted these people to have their own independence. He adopted the Maimonides-esque approach of putting people on their feet. So the Baron wants to make in Israel a business of winemaking. So he sends his representatives and experts to travel to the land of Israel to assess if the land is appropriate for winemaking, for grape growing, and for winemaking. And they return with a favorable report that the land of Israel is similar to Bordeaux, and they recommend him planting vineyards for the production of wine. The result was, and we're jumping a little bit ahead, the Carmel Winery, which became and has remained a very successful, very successful financial venture. The question is, that which intrigued me is why would the Baron, otherwise known as the well-known benefactor, be so interested in promoting winemaking? Why not a shoe factory, textiles, smartphone technology? Okay, I rescind the last idea. Uh, the answer would be that the Baron lived in Paris. So wine and the French are like hot dogs and baseball, like cream cheese and lox. And a more informed answer would be that Baron Edmund de Rothschild was the owner of the world-famous Chateau Lafitte Winery in Bordeaux. How do I know that it was famous? So it says in the Carmel website. 
So the Rothschild stipulated that his contributions not be made public. He wanted to maintain his anonymity. And that policy has been maintained. To this very day, there's a Rothschild Foundation which distributes large amounts of money, always doing it anonymously. Well known, yet nameless. Eventually, he's just shortened to, to be called the benefactor. And by the turn of the century, he has donated $6 million to the establishment of colonies within Israel. $6 million in today's money is about $188 million. That's a major wow. The determination and faith of pioneering settlers captured the Baron's heart. And here's a quotation from him. Not because of your poverty did I support you and take you under my wing. Thus he said to wine growers in, in Zechron Yaakov when he visited the Kali in 1893. And to conclude the quote, but due to your passion to work and live in the Holy Land and to live in accordance with the spirit of the Torah. He established no less than 44 colonies that were financed under the Baron's auspices or his, that of his descendants, from Natula all the way in the north to Maskerd Bacha in the south. The Baron invested enormous amounts of time and energy and financial resources for the development of this industry and the infrastructure of the Yishuv, convinced that ultimately he would put this early settlement on its own feet and be able to support themselves. His donations, however, were not a blank check. He didn't tell the colonists to go take the money and spend it as you wish. He had his experts overseeing that the money be spent wisely in accord with his instructions. According to Howard Sacher's A History of Israel, this demoralized the settlers. It's somewhat akin to Americans who donate so much money to Israel and then they expect to have a say in internal Israeli affairs. Not always is this appreciated. So both the Rishon Litzion settlement and the winery in, the Ad and, in the Rishon and in Zichron continued under Ottoman Empire during the World Wars, during the British Mandate, during all of Israel's wars, and it never stopped. Extremely successful venture. Sir Martin Gilbert notes, that the first Hebrew-speaking kindergarten in Israel was done in Rishon LeZion, and it was also the first elementary school. Rishon LeZion was established by just 10 immigrants from Russia, and as it looked like the settlement would actually take root and the settlement would exist and become permanent, an immigrant from, Mo, from Romania named Naftali Hertz Imber, with great pomp and circumstance, read a poem to the settlers. He, this fellow Imber is quite an intriguing individual. He is not the kind of person we would associate with a Zionist. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced the reason he came to Israel is because he was a secretary of very famous early Christian Zionists and visionaries, Sir Lawrence and Alice Oliphant. How do I know they were famous? Because thus it says in the Friends of Zion Museum. Now, Oliphant in, 18, in 1880 wrote a plan for the Jews to resettle in Palestine uh, under the Ottomans, under the protection of the British. Actually, nothing ever came out of his plan, but he was one year before Leon Pinsker in auto emancipation and 16 years before Herzl's Der Judenstadt. And clearly, uh, this fellow Imber, the poet, was influenced by the passion of Alice and Lawrence Oliphant. A different immigrant who came from Moldova set Imber's poetry to music. He was from Moldova. Imber actually was not a serious person. He wrote a book called Unpublished Legends of Tradition of the Jewish People in 1910, where he asserts that the tabernacle in the desert was powered by an electrical generator. He also said that King Solomon was the first one to develop the telephone. Nonetheless, he wrote this poem, which became a sensation among the Zionists. Meanwhile, Imber became a self-destructive drunk. That's very unusual because I'm 27 years old. I've never met a Jewish drunk, but Imber was a drunk. He would come to Zionist conferences and be begged to let in, and they wouldn't let him in because of his drawbacks. And he would be banging on the door, and he said, listen, you may get rid of me, but you'll be singing my music forever.
very much for joining our first episode of Teller from Jerusalem. I look forward to seeing you again and again. Let me say my, let me say my thank yous, first thing foremostly to Zev, whose idea it was, got this launched. I also like to thank Eliezer, who's the genius with all the technical, and I want to thank Diana for her golden voice. Please be so kind to subscribe, to comment, to share, bring other people, and I look forward to seeing you for an upcoming episode. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Teller from Jerusalem, where this series takes an intelligent and thought-provoking look at the past in order to acquire a perspective on the present. Spread knowledge by giving us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. Join us next time for a brand new episode and be sure to visit tellerfromjerusalem.com where you can find more details about the show and other useful information. Check out the site store and just by inserting the TFJ code, you'll receive an additional 10% discount off the already very reduced prices of all Hanoch Teller products, books, lectures, and documentaries. And remember, don't forget, you can get Teller from Jerusalem on any podcast platform or go to tellerfromjerusalem.com. Please see our YouTube channel for a richer than just audio experience with spiffy visual components and elements, also accessible from the Teller from Jerusalem website, where the list of general and specific credits are listed.